So this story from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke is known as... Say it a little bit louder. The prodigal son, right? That's what you've always heard. Have you heard it called anything else? I got no... Those of you that read my blog, no cheating. I know there's a few. I know there's at least one person here who has already read the blog this morning because they asked the question. So, but it's the prodigal son. We've heard this story over and over again, and it's and it's known to us as the story of the prodigal son, right? Because this chapter, the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, is about repentance and about how we turn around and come back to God, and it's about the things that are lost that that change their minds and come back to God, right? That's what this chapter is all about. This means yes, this means no, this means I don't know yet, but I hope that you're going to tell me because you're asking a question. If it's about the prodigal son, my question for you then is if this is the the name that you know this story by and it's supposed to help you understand what this story is, what does the word prodigal mean? Show of hands, how many know what the word prodigal means? The only reason I know is because I've got it on the dictionary on my phone. (laughs) If we don't know what the word prodigal means, then how does that title actually help us understand what what this story is about? Right? So if you had to guess what the word prodigal means, what do you think? What do you think the word prodigal means? Special? Special? I like that one better than than what it actually means. (laughs) Wayward. Okay. What else? Gifted? Anything else? Persecution? Persecution? Prodigal means to spend uh, frivolously. To, to uh, extravagantly use your, your wealth or your time in a way that may not be good for you, right? So it's the prodigal son because he's the one who went to his father and got his part portion of the his portion of the what belonged to his father, right? And basically when he went to his father, here's the things we have to unpack about this story and we have to understand about this chapter. When when this younger son went to his father and said, "Give me what is mine." What was he actually saying to his father? "Give me my inheritance." But what was he actually saying to his father? How does one get an inheritance? When somebody dies. So the younger son goes to his fathers and says, You're dead to me, give me what's mine. That's what he says to his father. You're dead to me, give me what's mine. And his father does what? He doesn't throw him out. <laughs> he doesn't tell him that he's he's you know, you 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 you, you, you I raised you this long and this is how you treat me, right? He divides up his estate and he gives the younger son what belongs to him. And how much would that have been? Not that this matters, but how much would the younger son have gotten? No. A third. The older son would have gotten two thirds of the estate. And that's the way that it would have worked. The older son would have gotten the larger portion, even if there was multiple sons. If there was four or five sons, the older son still would have gotten about 60% of the estate. And then the younger sons would have to divide up what was left. It's good to be the firstborn. <laughs> and that's not me, so <laughs> I would I would have had to split up the peanuts at the end. But right? So the, the younger son gets his third and he goes off and how does he spend his money? How does how does he go and spend his money? On prostitutes. And how do we know that? Because the older son tells us, and how does the older son know that? We don't know how the younger son spends his money. It says that he spent it frivolously on lavish living, right? What if he had so much money that he thought he didn't have to worry about it and he was spending money like there was no tomorrow, right? Have you heard that before? They spend money like there's no tomorrow. I got money burning a hole in my pocket, so I got to spend it. And this is how the younger son was. And then what happened? And we miss this in the Western world. The younger son had spent all of his money, and then what happened? What happened? A famine hit. Do you know that? Do you realize that that's part of that story? It says the younger son went to the father, said, you're dead to me. Give me what's mine. I went off. I spent all my money on just living, right? 
Not necessarily in a bad way, but in a way that's maybe not looking to the future. And then a famine hits, which means there's no possibility that anything can be given to me. And then in Eastern worlds, it says that he went out and he got a job as a hired hand working at a farm and, and that the, um, he, he was feeding pigs. Do you get what's wrong with that? He's a Jew. Are pigs clean in Jewish law? No, you're not even supposed to be around them if you're a Jew. You're, there's no way that you should be slopping pigs if you're a Jew. So this good Jewish boy is now out slopping the pigs because that's all he can do. He's come so far down that there's really no more, there's no more way that he can go down. He's to the bottom. He's hit rock bottom. He's doing anything possible to get him where he needs to be. And then in Eastern in the Eastern world, people go, why didn't people give him anything? Because it says that specifically. It says that he lost all his money. He got a job working as a hired hand for somebody, slopping pigs, and no one gave him anything. In the Eastern world, that's the thing that they, they latch on to, is that no one helped him. No one gave him any food. No one gave him any support. No one was there to help him. The community basically just let him down. Even though he was an outsider there, the community still in the Eastern church would have picked him up and helped him through that. Right? It depends on where you're living, how this parable hits you. But then it says he came to himself and he ran back and his father, blah, 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 blah. And it's all about repentance, right? So if this chapter of, God, of Luke, chap, Luke chapter 15 is all about repentance, and that we have to include the two parables before this. So my family's already ready for this. Here comes your two corny jokes for the morning. <laughs> if this is a, truly a chapter about repentance... We have to go back to the two parables before this, right? Jesus was meeting with the Pharisees and the scribe, and he was eating with tax collectors and sinners, and he was doing all this stuff, and he said, I tell to you these parables. There was a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one went wandering off. So he left the ninety-nine on the hill to go in search of the one that was lost. Right? And there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the ninety-nine who don't need repentance. And then the next story is, there was a widow who had ten coins, and she lost one of them, and she turns her house upside down, sweeping and looking for, for, the, for the coin, and goes out and invites everybody after she finds it to come. And what I had lost is now found. And again, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than those who don't need to repent. So if this is truly about the items that are lost being repentant, I ask you, how does a sheep repent? How does a sheep repent? Anyone? All right. Yeah. Do it louder. I'm sorry I've been bad. <laughs> and if it's about the coin repenting, right? How does a coin repent? I promise I'll change. I warned you. Remember last last week I talked about how Luke is more about repentance. He uses the word metanoia in its in his conjugates more than any other gospel. And if the Luke chapter fifteen is truly about repentance, don't you think that he would use that word a lot in this chapter? I mean, there's how many verses? Thirty six verses in this chapter. How many times do you think Luke uses the word for repentance in this chapter? Twice, and they're both at the end of those first two parables, right? There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than those who don't need to. It's not in any of the stories about people repenting. See, the story about the prodigal son is not about the prodigal son, because how does this parable start? Jesus told them a parable. He said there was a son who had an older brother and a father. No. He said there was a man. Who had two sons. So what is the story about? The man. It's not about the son. The son is merely a role actor in the thing. He's a great supporting actor. But the story is not about him. The story is about the father. And the ways that the father dishonors himself. Over and over and over again. Because of love for his children. You know, list them. The first time that he dishonors himself is when the younger son comes to him and says, 
You're dead to me, give me what's mine. And the father does what? Okay, here, fine. The second time is when, and we don't get this one. But as the son is out there, and I've linked this this morning on my blog to my, one, of, one of my favorite movies, which is actually not this morning. Ha, I got y'all. <laughs> My favorite movie is the movie I tried to borrow this morning, but couldn't. No, it's not your fault. She couldn't find it. Finding Nemo. Because Finding Nemo is the story of the prodigal son. If you look at it the way that you should be looking at it. Because it's not about Nemo going out and touching the butt and getting caught and, <laughs> and being taken off, right? The movie is really about Marlin. And Dory, who swim all over the ocean to look for Nemo. Because that's what a father does when they've lost their child. They risk life and limb to go everywhere. And this father, this, this high man, this, cause he had an estate big enough that he could separate it between his two children, gave half of it, or a third of it to his younger son, sent him off, and as, and as the son is gone, what is the father doing? Is he going about his daily business as normal? We actually don't really know, but there is a clue in our text that tells us because it says when the son returned to the father, the father saw saw him far off and he did what? He ran to him. In Jesus day and age, a man of this stature would never run. Fail P.E. class. Because they had slaves to do that for them. But he loved his son so much that he couldn't wait for him to come up. That he was running out to to greet him. And when he ran out to greet him, he called the slaves. He called the slaves. Hey, bring me a robe. And bring me a ring. And bring me some sandals. And is this this thing? It's like a terry cloth bathrobe. Is that what we're talking about here? No, this is the robe that the father would have worn. It's one of the father's nice robes. And it shows that this person has stature. And this ring, is it any just little old ring? No, it's a signet ring. It's a ring that he can seal documents with for his father's household. And sandals showed what? That you're not a slave. You're a member of the household. Slaves didn't wear shoes. Members of the household did. So this robe, this ring, and these sandals are not just merely things to cover him because he doesn't have enough clothes to wear. These are things for the father saying, everything that you've done in the past is completely forgiven of you. And you are a part of my household and you are my son. And he brings the son in and he kills the calf and they have a party. And why did they have a party? Who was the party for? Who was the party for? Right. It's not for the son. The shepherd has a party with his friends. That's for the shepherd, not the sheep. And the woman has a party with her friends. It's not for the coin. It's for her. And the father has a party with his friends. For who? For him to celebrate what he's got back. And then what happens? The older son comes in and the father does what? He dishonors himself again by leaving his party to go out to get his son. So if we really want to call this parable something that means something to us, we need to call it, as Henry Nowen would say, the waiting father. Because the father doesn't do anything other than wait for his younger son to come home. Because that's what he does. And, and you know, I, I like Henry Nowen. I think he's a great scholar. But I don't like that title. So we call it the loving father. Because it's all about what the father does for, for the sons, right? For both the sons. And I used to really like that title, and that's what I always called it. And I think that might even be what my blog is called today. I don't remember. But I've come this morning to the realization that I don't even think that's the right title for this. For this. It's actually the prodigal father. Why? Because prodigal means, again, if you remember, spending frivolously. And how does God give you his grace? It's, it's a little weird to talk about, I know. You know. It's okay if you're a little weirded out by me saying that God frivolously gives out grace. But that's exactly what he does. He has so much that he doesn't have to worry about it. 
And he loves each and every one of us so much that he's going to give up everything he has and send his son himself, right? When he sent Jesus, remember, who's telling the story? Jesus is. So God is telling the story about the love of a father that goes to extreme distances to dishonor himself, to chase down the, the ones who have been lost. And you know what? That's each and every one of us. As if we're not the younger son frivolously going out and spending what we've got and not knowing how much the father loves us. We're the older son who thinks that we're doing everything right and that we should be honored by God because it's everything that we've done. And in the end, it has absolutely nothing to do with any of us. It's all about how abundantly and graciously God gives to and loves each and every one of us. And that's what this story is about. It's not about repentance. It is about repentance. But it's mainly about the love of a father who will go to extreme distances to chase you down anywhere that you've gone. So live into that love and give that love to everyone.